Welcome to this lecture where we will be looking at the pathophysiology of asthma. Asthma is defined as a chronic inflammatory respiratory condition that causes reversible episodes of variable airflow obstruction due to constriction and narrowing of the airways. Before we look at the pathogenesis of asthma, let's recap some basic anatomy and physiology. The process by which cells combine oxygen with glucose molecules to create energy is known as cellular respiration, and a waste product of cellular respiration is carbon dioxide. Cells need a constant supply of oxygen to function, as well as a method of removing their waste products. This is achieved by the pulmonary system. Blood is pumped through the pulmonary circulation where diffusion of gases can take place within the alveoli. Alveoli are the functional aspects of the lung tissue responsible for gaseous exchange. Carbon dioxide moves down its concentration gradient into the alveoli and oxygen moves down its concentration gradient from the alveoli and binds to haemoglobin. The delivery of oxygen to the alveoli and removal of carbon dioxide out of the lungs is known as ventilation. Ventilation has two phases. The first phase is inspiration, which is an active process where the diaphragm and intercostal muscles contract in a downwards and outwards motion. This increases the size of the thoracic cavity and reduces intrathoracic pressure. As the pressure inside the thoracic cavity decreases, it is overcome by atmospheric pressure. This allows air to move into the lungs and oxygenate the alveoli. The second phase is expiration. In contrast to inspiration, this is a passive process, which means no muscle contractions are involved during normal expiration. The diaphragm and intercostal muscles relax, which increase intrathoracic pressure. Once this pressure is greater than the atmospheric pressure, air will be exhaled with the expulsion of waste products such as carbon dioxide. Both these processes combine to make ventilation. In order for air to be exchanged between the atmosphere and alveoli, it must travel through a network of tubes within the lungs known as the small and large airways which consist of the main bronchi, the bronchioles, and the tertiary bronchioles. These airways do not participate in the diffusion of gases, but provide the alveoli with access to the external environment. Asthma is a disease that affects these small airways. The bronchi and bronchioles consist of three main layers. The mucosa layer consists of pseudo-stratified columnar epithelial cells which line the inside of the airway. These cells have cilia on their apical surface and a thin secretion of mucus which makes the mucociliary escalator. This is a pulmonary defence system that traps pathogens and dirt and beats them up the respiratory tract where they can be coughed up or swallowed. Amongst these epithelial cells are other cells, such as goblet cells, which secrete the mucus. There are dendritic cells, which are part of the innate immune system. There are also afferent nerve endings of the vagus nerve situated along the basement membrane of these cells, which is important when we go on to discuss the treatment. Below the basement membrane is the lamina propria, which consists mainly of collagen, fibrin, elastin, T helper 2 cells, B cells, and mast cells. Situated underneath the lamina propria is the bronchial muscle layer, and below this is the submucosa with the adventitia. 
So now we have an understanding of normal physiology, let's look at the changes seen in asthma. Asthma can be divided into two categories based on what triggers the individual's attacks. Atopic or extrinsic asthma is caused by a hypersensitivity reaction to normal particles which ordinarily would not initiate an immune response. It is called extrinsic because the patient needs to be exposed to factors in the environment. Most commonly, these include triggers such as pollen, dust, pet hair, smoke, pollutants and medications. Non-atopic or intrinsic asthma is not a hypersensitivity and is invoked by things such as stress, cold weather and exercise. Although asthma is separated into two categories, often triggers can overlap and patient triggers can be multifactorial. Non-atopic asthma is not well understood and the exact mechanism of action is unknown. Let's move on to look at the pathogenesis of atopic or extrinsic asthma which has a well understood mechanism of action. A patient will be exposed to an allergen which initiates an unnecessary immune response. The allergen reacts with dendritic cells within the mucosa which then phagocytose the particle and present the allergen to a T helper 2 cell through a major histocompatibility 2 complex on its cell membrane. The T helper 2 cell will interact with the antigen and the major histocompatibility 2 complex through its CD4 receptor and T cell receptor and produces an inappropriate immune response. The T cell releases two very important cytokines, interleukin 4 and interleukin 5. Interleukin 4 activates B lymphocytes, also known as B cells, which when activated become plasma cells. These plasma cells can now start to synthesize and release immunoglobulins, which are specific to the antigen that they first encountered. These immunoglobulins are immunoglobulin E antibodies and embed on the cell surface of mast cells. The IgE antibody can now react to the allergen if it is encountered again, stimulating the mast cell to undergo degranulation, which is a term used to describe the release of inflammatory chemicals from within the mast cell. Important chemicals released are histamines and leukotrienes. Histamines stimulate the afferent vagus nerve which in turn causes the efferent vagus nerve to release acetylcholine onto muscarinic 3 receptors within the bronchial smooth muscle, initiating contraction and therefore constriction. This is of important clinical context when we discuss treatment and management. Histamine also causes vasodilation and edema within the bronchial smooth muscle, increasing the level of bronchoconstriction. Leukotrienes C4, D4 and E4 cause bronchospasm to try and stop the pathogen from further infecting the lung, as well as vasodilation and increased capillary permeability to allow other immune proteins to enter the area. The increase in blood flow and vascular permeability contributes to the bronchoconstriction, worsening the inflammation. Interleukin-4 will also stimulate hypersecretion of mucus from goblet cells, thus narrowing the bronchial lumen even further. Interleukin-5 acts as a chemotactic agent, an activating agent for eosinophils. Eosinophils then release cytokines and leukotrienes to attract further white blood cells to the area. Eosinophils also release proteases, which cause tissue damage when released chronically. This causes remodeling of the airways with fibroblast proliferation and scar tissue being formed. It also increases the hypersensitivity of bronchioles and damages ciliated epithelial cells which then impairs the mucociliary escalator, leading to the formation of mucus plugs. A typical sign in asthma 
is eosinophilia, which means the presence of eosinophils. The latent response of eosinophils can cause a biphasic asthma response or the delayed asthma response after the initial asthma attack. This typically occurs six to eight hours after the initial attack, and this is due to the delayed response of eosinophils and other immune cells releasing chemical mediators of inflammation. This is important to bear in mind when treating an asthma attack, as symptoms may have been resolved with treatment but could return again later. We will discuss this more in the treatment and management. Remember, this is a normal immune response that you would see in a microbial infection but that is stimulated by a harmless antigen. The combined effects of mast cell degranulation, the release of histamine and leukotrienes and the recruitment of eosinophils leads to bronchoconstriction, vasodilation, increased vascular permeability and immune cell infiltration which gives asthma its typical triad of airflow obstruction, bronchohyperresponsiveness and inflammation. This partial airway obstruction increases the resistance airflow has to overcome to adequately ventilate the alveoli, especially during expiration. As we discussed earlier, expiration is a passive process which involves the relaxation of respiratory muscles. During inspiration, these muscles can help overcome the narrowed airways, but during expiration, there is no mechanical assistance. Impaired expiration can lead to air becoming trapped in the alveoli and hyperinflation. This air trapping is not equal throughout the lung, as the degree of airflow obstruction will be varied throughout the bronchioles, leading to a varied ventilation perfusion ratio within different segments of the lung. The trapping of air leads to increased intrapleural and alveoli pressures, which can then cause some of the complications that patients may experience. Now let's look at some of the factors that increase a patient's chance of developing asthma. Asthma is a familial disorder with multiple genes being identified that play a role in susceptibility. The exact reasons as to why a person develops asthma is unknown, but it is thought to be multifactorial, and those who have other atopic conditions such as eczema and hay fever are more susceptible to having asthma. To recap, asthma is defined as a chronic inflammatory respiratory condition that causes reversible episodes of variable airflow obstruction due to constriction and narrowing of the airways. Patients with asthma are asymptomatic between attacks. Asthma can be atopic, which means it is caused by environmental factors such as pollutants, or non-atopic, which means it can be caused by intrinsic factors such as stress. Atopic asthma is caused by an inappropriate immune response in the small airways leading to airflow obstruction, bronchohyperresponsiveness and inflammation, which leads to inadequate ventilation. Thank you for watching and I hope you found this video helpful. Be sure to check out our other video on the signs, symptoms, investigations and management of asthma. And if there are any topics you would like us to cover, then please leave a comment in the comment section below.